All right, hi everybody. Our uh, talk today is called a shared medical appointment for type ones. We're gonna go through kind of common case scenarios that everybody with type one diabetes faces and hope we can give you some tools to kind of triage these things. So again, I'm Jeremy Pettis. I'm an adult endocrinologist in uh, San Diego. I have type one myself uh, since the age of 15. And I'm gonna let my esteemed uh, co-panelists introduce themselves as well. So how about you, Leslie? Hi, I'm Leslie Island. I'm an adult endocrinologist uh, in Omaha, Nebraska at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I am the medical director of our telemedicine department, so I do mostly um, telemedicine for my clinic time. And I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when I was 25 in medical school. All right, Carrie. And my name is Carrie Sparling. I'm an adult who's seasoned endocrinologist, so it's not exactly the same, but close enough. Um, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when I was seven in 1986. So over the last 15 years or so, I've been sharing a lot of my uh, stories about living with type 1 diabetes online through my blog, Six Until Me, and then through other websites. And I'm really stoked to be joining the TCOID group for this conversation. Yeah, and you know, so we got three type 1s, uh, two MDs, and Carrie is here for her brilliant color commentary. And um, <laughs> we're gonna have fun with this. So let me get into a few background slides, and I'm gonna, um, just give you an overview of kind of a continuous glucose monitor download because we're going to be talking a lot about cases that, that revolve around CGMs basically. And so to get oriented with this, um, this is a Dexcom report, but all the reports shows, you know, the similar data. So you just kind of have to get used to where your particular report might show things. Um, but when you look at these and try to learn from them, you can learn a lot. So every report will give you an average glucose, and that's for the time period that you select. So in this case, it's over the last 30 days. This particular person has had an average blood sugar of 155. And from that, it'll calculate an estimated A1C, which in my opinion can actually be even more accurate than the lab data, because the lab can be affected by all different types of things that can make your A1C artificially high or artificially low. It'll give you a standard deviation, meaning how much you vary around that mean. So the higher the standard deviation, the more kind of swings you have around your average blood sugar. So in general, you want a lower standard deviation. And then importantly, we now have this time and range data. And this time and range means that here in this green bar is the time that you're spending between a blood sugar of 70 and 180. So we want that number to be as big as possible because that's time you have kind of in an, in an ideal range. And then this 1% here is time less than 70, kind of a mild low. And the 0% here is time less than 55, a more severe low. And then the top in yellow, you have time above 180, so the time kind of hyperglycemic. So looking at this, you can get a ton of data right away. And this is kind of blowing this up, showing that time and range between 70 and 180. And then down here, what this is, is sometimes this is confusing to people what this means. So this is um, a day from midnight to midnight. And you can see in the dotted black line is the average blood sugar for that time of day. So for example, at 6 a.m., the average blood sugar is maybe 150 or so. And these gray bars are the amount of variation you have around that time. So you can see at you know, maybe 9 a.m. or so, there's not that much variation, but maybe at 10 p.m. there is a lot. So when you look at this, you can see kind of overall average blood sugar throughout the day. And then times there might be kind of quote unquote problems, times where you might be high or times that you might be low. So you can say, gosh, every day after breakfast, I'm high, or every day after lunch, I'm, I'm going low or whatever it might be. So just from this intro slide, you can get a ton of information and everybody should really review their own data so you can start to become kind of your own endocrinologist, if you will. And then what's fun is that a lot of these reports will have your best glucose day, um, which is interesting because it's nice to get a pat on your back, you know, some good news about diabetes, a, a positive reward rather than, oh, I was high or I was low. This is a day that I really kicked butt. This isn't me, but what you can say, this was you. And this is especially nice if you look back on it and you can say this was two days ago. Like, what did I do that day that I was in range, in this case, 94% of the time, my average blood sugar is 136. And you can start to learn from these things. Oh yeah, you know, I realized I ate lower carb or I went for a run or whatever it is. Or maybe it was just the fact that I was missing data for six hours and I was high that whole time or whatever it might be. Um, but you can get some kind of good info from this as well. So what are our goals? And, um, this is kind of what we've agreed on as a diabetes society, if you will. 
that we wanna keep our average blood sugar less than 155 in general, which corresponds to an A1C less than 7%. Um, we want to keep our standard deviation on the lower side. It's hard to really just, you know, target your standard deviation and do something about it. But in general, the lower, the better. Importantly, we want to keep our time and range. If we can, the goal is above 70%. We know that the more time you have in that range, yes, you have better blood sugars. Yes, you're at lower risk for microvascular complications. But I find the more time and range that I have, it just means that diabetes isn't bothering me. I'm not high. I'm not low. I don't have to do things about my diabetes. I'm not getting alarms going off. And you want your time low, less than 5%. And that's total time between 70 and you know, the, the, the more severe low. So keeping these kinds of things in mind is important. Everybody should look at their data. And you can see, gosh, my time range is 80%. I'm kicking butt. Or my time range is 50 50%. I should talk to my provider about you know, ways that I can get this under better control. Or my time and range is 80%, that's great, but I have a lot of time hypoglycemic. How can I target you know, my lows? So knowing these kind of goals is critical, it's just like knowing what your goals are for your blood pressure or your cholesterol or whatever it might be. Um, but we have these kind of ranges that everybody should know about. So the way that the rest of this talk is gonna work now that I can shut up for a little bit, is we have, as Carrie was saying, a diabetes choose your own adventure in terms of these different cases that we can talk about. There's my CGM going off telling me I'm a bad diabetic and I'm gonna whip myself after this. Um, but um, so these are our cases we have. So no matter what, I spike high after meals, I'm low all the time, is that bad for me? Is my basal rate right? How do I bolus for fat and protein? How does alcohol affect my blood sugar? So Carrie, since you are our, I don't know, you're just Carrie, why don't you go ahead and uh, pick a topic for us and uh, and tell us, uh, tell us why you're picking that topic, though. Well, I, I'm going to, first of all, I have to cross-check you on the whole bad diabetic thing. I cannot let people say that phrase. I refuse to let you say that phrase. You are not a bad diabetic. You are experiencing blood sugars that are not in range. Doesn't make you a crumb. But in kind of keeping with that whole theme, I think we should start with the first one. The no matter what, I spike high after meals. Don't take it personally, Jeremy. But okay. just in you know, case you have to be I'm proud of, of how I made this PowerPoint. That is like, watch this. Boom. We go to this one. Okay, so Leslie, do you want to kind of take us through this? Yeah, do you uh, have any comments you want to make based on these images that you've provided us? Um, no, this is just, you know, the Fresh Prince and this other guy being surprised that they're high, I guess, <laughs> <Bless you. laughs> or otherwise. Um, okay. And I have to advance your slides, right? Or can you do you it? You do, yeah. Okay. I don't think so. So I'll build this one out next for you if you want to talk about it. Sure. So another, uh, I think what, this is two weeks of data uh, in a UGM profile. And so just, you know, getting a general overview, of their average blood sugar for those last two weeks is in the 140s. It's pretty good. That's an A1C between six and 7%. The standard deviation is really pretty decent in the 30s. Uh, and when you look at their time and range breakdown, hypoglycemia is not a problem for this person. They're only 1% less than 70. Um, our goal time and range is 70% between 70 and 180, and they're pretty close. They're 63%, and the rest of their time is high. Uh, but when you look at their 24-hour overview from midnight to midnight, I think the most clear thing that jumps out at you is that they're really popping up around lunchtime. And if we could improve that part of their day, then things may really kind of smooth out um, and go even better. There it is, I agree. So this is a great image. Um, so why, I mean, why do we care about spikes after meals? Um, I guess for a couple of reasons. There's some, you know, not good early data about glycemic variability and how that relates to complications. We don't have maybe quite as much data um, as we do with the A1C and complications, but it may not be good. And it also doesn't make us feel good, right? It doesn't feel good to have those swings from high to low. Um, and then if you do spike up really high after meal, it makes you worry a little bit, right? You may um, feel like you ate more carbs than you accounted for, or maybe something's wrong with your pump site, and it tends to lead us to do these really aggressive rage boluses sometimes, which then lead to subsequent hypoglycemia, which then leads to more hyperglycemia, and it can really kind of set you up on this yo-yo for a good um, part of your day. You know, I'm just realizing that can you see my pointer? Who is, is that Steve? Yeah, this is Steve. I'm just realizing that <laughs> Steve, Steve's curly hair. So I think that's important that these spikes happen to everybody, you know, Absolutely. A couple endos on the call. And even though we know a lot about diabetes and 
um, all these things. It happens to everybody and it drives you nuts and you do multiple bolses and you usually go low. So it's super common. So we have a couple ideas about how to fight the spike. There's a couple of things you can do. First and foremost, you can pre-bolus prior to the meal. I feel like whoever, um, you know, was initially marketing Novolog or Humalog really, really oversold how quickly they, they work, right? I mean, I think people were initially told um, you can't take the bolus until, at, you know, the food is entering your mouth. Otherwise, you will, you know, your blood sugars will tank and you will immediately become hypoglycemia. And that's just, um, that's really not, not the case, right? These insulins don't really start working for 10 or 15 minutes. They don't peak until an hour and they're in our system for about three or four hours. So bolusing prior to the meal, which we, I think we have an upcoming slide about, can be really helpful to prevent the spike. You can slow down your meal. You can break up your meal into a couple of different parts. You can not, you know, just whatever you do, you can try to avoid just having a, a big bolus of, of carbs in your stomach all at once. Anything else you want to add about that one? Well, I do that all the time, to be honest. I mean, Steve gives me a hard time that when I get a sandwich, I like inhale the first half of it. And then I just <laughs> sit on the second half. And like, um, I think that's a learned behavior that it's just a little bit, I don't like to not eat food, but if you can kind of eat the first half, assess, you know, what's happened and then maybe, you know, bolus again for the second half can be, can be helpful. Yeah. What's next? Uh, you can eat lower carb too, right? Which, which will allow things to go better. You won't spike up quite as high if you're not eating very high carb meals. Or you can try newer insulins like Afreza, the inhaled insulin, which we'll talk about coming up. Um, and then two newer insulins um, uh, that are still sub-Q that are Fiasp and, uh, how do you say that? Lumjev. 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 Which was just approved like a couple weeks ago. Yeah. So Carrie, any thoughts about this list? I'm just unsure about the pronunciation on that, on that last one, but for just going back to pre-bolusing. So for people who were diagnosed, so I was diagnosed in 1986 and I started on regular and NPH insulin. And so I was trained to pre-bolus like 45 minutes to an hour before my meal. And I was also encouraged to be a member of the clean plate club because diagnosed at the age of seven, if you're taking insulin that was peaking, you couldn't skip meals. You couldn't not eat exactly what was on your plate. And that does set a lot of adults with type one up for kind of a weird mangled version of how they're supposed to eat. Because you think if you leave plate on your food or you count your carbs you know, uh, correctly and then don't eat for all of them, it's, it's hard to sort of navigate how you're supposed to dose for that. There's a little bit of a mental game that comes with eating the food, not just the math of it. Yeah, Does that absolutely. Sound? I think, Leslie, let me handle this one because I talked sure. about this slide a lot because I think it's important. I'm gonna minimize your guys' faces so everybody can see it. Um, so this is a really simple study, but it, it makes a very good point. And what they did is they took a group of type ones, they gave them all the exact same amount of carbs, they bolus the exact same amount, but the difference between these different curves is when people took their insulin relative to the meal. So the dotted line here is when people put, took their insulin 20 minutes before they ate, and then these other lines is if they took their insulin right when they ate or 20 minutes after. So a couple of really you know, nice points. One, what I learned is that if you take your insulin at the time of the meal, you might as well take it 20 minutes after because you're already way behind. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. And then clearly, if you take it 20 minutes before you eat, you get you know, a much reduced spike in your blood sugar. And why is it important to avoid that spike? Yeah, we want lower blood sugars, but what would happen if you ate and your blood sugar went up to 230? Well, if it was me, I'm gonna take out you know, my pen or use my pump to take more insulin. And I probably wouldn't have needed it because if I just didn't do anything, I would have come back on my own. But if you bolus again up here, you probably are gonna go low and then you eat everything in the fridge and then you go high and then you rage bolus and you go low and you just get on that roller coaster. So this simple kind of thing of pre-bolusing can really help to avoid this. But one of the things that people always say is, yeah, but you know, I never know how much I'm going to eat and I'm worried about taking the whole dose. And I say, you know, just take something. So if you know that a typical dinner is six to 10 units, whatever it might be, take three or four units, you know, 20, 30 minutes before you eat, get that insulin acting. So, you know, it's, it's there to kind of fight the meal when you start eating. And then you can take the rest when you sit down. So there's ways to make this work, but if you don't change anything other than just doing this pre bolusing it will make a huge difference promise. All right, I promise you. So Leslie, uh, Carrie, anything to say? No, I agree. That I say the same thing about, you know, for people who 
aren't sure what exactly they're going to eat, just putting in, um, you know, half of uh, what they think they might eat or, or something, just allow things to marinate a little bit, I think goes, goes much more smoothly. Yeah. And, and this is uh, easier said than done. Um, you know, you have to plan ahead. I tell people that, you know, bolus, like if you're out to eat, bolus when you order. So by the time it comes there, you know, at least you have something going. Bolus when you start preparing food. So when you actually sit down to eat, um, you know, that uh, you're ready. Oh, there's an arrow showing the effect. Okay. What about the low carb thing? <laughs> I mean, it does work, right? It reduces your margin of error. And I think there are a lot more options now than there were maybe, you know, 10, 20 years ago, right? Like more websites with more recipes, more options at the grocery store. And it, I think it's reasonable to, to try it. I guess if I try it, we're not saying 20 grams a day, you know, um, of, of carbohydrates. But if you're doing, if you're eating 100 grams of carbs with every meal, try cutting that to 50 grams with every meal for a week or so and see how this goes. If you're eating 50, 60 grams per meal, try cutting that to 20 or 30 grams per meal and see how that goes. And maybe compare your CGM from one week to the next and see if it makes a difference. And it probably will. It's just a matter of um, how sustainable it is. And I think it's really hard when one person in the household is doing their best to eat low carb and nobody else is. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's usually not sustainable. Carrie, what, what's your take on low carb? Or do you have any kind of approaches diet wise to, to diabetes in general? Well, I, again, raised as a small kid with, with type one, I was told that with the right dosing of insulin, I could eat anything that I wanted to. And I totally subscribe to that, but just because I can put it into my mouth and mash it up and swallow it, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best course of action for me. And so I had to think of food in a way that made it so I was making choices that did net out better for my blood sugars, didn't feel like I was missing out or deprived of anything or that sort of stuff. But like, it was easier for me to eat a hamburger without a bun and not ride a 300 afterwards than it was to eat the bun and say, see, I can eat anything I want and then have those regrets. So I was never driven by low carb pressure, but doing it on my own, I saw why it worked. Yeah, I would say most type ones gravitate towards a lower carb, doesn't mean zero carb, but mm -hmm. it just makes life a little bit easier. And just because you're low carb doesn't mean it's like high, high lame, you know, I mean, you can find good tasting food. <laughs> isn't that the phrase, like, low carb, high lame? Like, yeah. isn't that how that goes? <laughs> You know, I love going to in and out you know, I don't, you know, you guys don't have it on the heat. Uh, you don't have Well, I should, you know, we didn't say in the beginning that Leslie, you're in Omaha, Carrie is in, um, I'm guessing you're in Rhode Island right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're from all over the country right now. Yeah. But anyways, the point we're in is, the middle of a pandemic. We're not going anywhere. I am where I am. Like, no in and out of anything. <laughs> well, I'm going in and out after this. And I'm going to get my, uh, protein style burgers, you know, so you can get things that are lettuce wrapped. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of cauliflower rice now. I mean, because honestly, to me, why do people eat rice? It's just a mechanism to get whatever sauce it is in your mouth. So you can find ways of, you know, making that low carb cauliflower rice still soaks up the sauce well. So there's, there's ways to, to make this work. Sometimes people have cheat days. Um, other things people are trying now is kind of these intermittent fasting things where they'll stop eating after 8 p.m. or so and not eat until noon the next day. So there's different ways to kind of play around with, with, with dietary things to, to help with your blood sugar. So I think we'll kind of mm -hmm. leave it at that. So what is a Frezza? I'm going to build this out. Leslie, you want to take this? Yeah, sure. So a Frezza is inhaled insulin. It comes, it's, it's administered like this. So there's this removable um, purple mouthpiece and then which covers up this white mouthpiece. And when you flip it open, it looks like this. There's a purple base that you pop a little cartridge in and then um, close the top and you're good to go. I think we have a video of Steve demonstrating this later on, don't we? So it comes in four, eight, and 12 unit cartridges, but four is not like four units of your regular CQ insulin. I don't, I don't know if you have thoughts, Jeremy. I think on the website, they, or the, the company recommends starting with kind of multiplying by 1.5 to try to figure out your dose. It takes some trial and error. I kind of find that it's about half as potent. So a four is more like two, two and a half, and eight's more like four or five, and 12 is more like six or seven. Is that how you yeah, think of it? So I think of about a half as potent. So four units of a Frezza is more like two units of Humalog, Novolog. Um, so this is kind of what you look like. What's that? Carrie, have you used a Frezza or do you use it? I, I haven't used it yet and um, I can't wait to, like I'm pretty stoked to try it out because I've heard really good things, but it's just been one of those things that I've had a little bit of trouble getting my endo to, sign on for yeah it's well, uh 
started using it about a year ago. Um, and I think sometimes I use it often during a week. Sometimes I'll go a week or two without using it. Um, but I think it's just a really nice option, a nice like something nice to have on hand. And we like it because it works in minutes, right? It starts working immediately. So you do not need to pre-bolus with a Frezza. You can just take it at the time of the meal, maybe even a little bit um, later into the meal. And then it's in and out of your system in about 90 minutes. So the, the tricky thing is you need to be on CGM when you use it, and it does take some trial and error. And sometimes if you're only using a Frezza for the meal bolus, you can um, start to see a rise in your blood sugars about 90 minutes after eating. And sometimes it requires a, a second follow-up bolus. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, do you have yeah, anyone say, advice about that? You know, backing up, that there's, there's two things that are interesting about it. One is it's inhaled. Um, I don't care so much about that because we're all used to taking injections and things like that. But the other is just how fast it works. It truly works almost immediately when you inhale it. Um, and then it's out of your system in 90 minutes or so. So it's a much sharper tool to um, control your blood sugars. Um, so again, it starts working within minutes. It's out of your system in 90 minutes. Compare that to Humalog or Novolog that take 30 minutes or so to start working, an hour and a half to peak and then they hang around in five for five hours, it, it's very, very different. And that's what's shown here, that the kind of activity profile of a Frezza and these white dots, that it peaks, you know, really within 15 minutes. I mean, imagine that you take something and within 15 minutes it's, it's peaking. Um, and then it's out of your system by an hour and a half or so, that's in white, compared to Humalog and Novolog that have kind of this more traditional, um, you know, slow moving uh, profile. So a Frezza is much closer to kind of what the normal human pancreas is capable of doing. Still not there yet, but it truly is a rapid acting insulin that a lot of people are not aware even exists. It's very underutilized. Um, it takes some learning in terms of adjusting the dosage, um, you know, knowing that it's half as potent. Leslie, like you were saying, taking it actually when you start eating or maybe even a little bit after you start eating is important. And then again, yeah, you might need to take another dose an hour and a half or two hours after you eat because it might wear off. So a lot of little changes in the way that you typically dose insulin, but if you can do it and do it right, it's a very sharp and precise tool um, that can give you like really tight control in your blood sugars. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. So I'll just, oh, go ahead. I don't know, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, cause this was an example of, of my CGM. This was probably a while ago. And I went up to 300, God knows why. I carry, I was being bad again. And, uh, say that. <laughs> and uh, I took eight units of a Frezza and I went from 300 down to, you know, 100 in a period of, I don't know, maybe an hour. And this kind of trajectory is something that you just don't see with Humalog or Novolog. And then importantly, I didn't go low. You know, this is what Steve calls kind of exit stage right, where the, it stops, stops working and my blood sugar is kind of just flattened out. So this is something that you just would never see before if you would take Humalog or Novolog. So the speed of which it corrects, and people always say, well, is this good? Do you feel low? And not really. I would rather, you know, bring my blood sugars down and get about, you know, on with my day rather than having this drag on for like five hours where I'm giving myself boluses and boluses and boluses and it takes maybe all day for you to get back in, you know, in range. So that's, that's really nice. Um, and, and this just says, what else is it good for? Leslie, I don't know if you want to comment on this. Oh, I mean, I think it's just, it's good if you really, if there's a meal that you know has historically not gone well for me, for you, but you're with family or friends or you're celebrating and you just want to, eat whatever that is, like your never ending pasta bowl or a you know, big bag of Halloween candy. I think um, you know, it goes well for just bigger high carb meals. Yeah. And I think it's common when you have diabetes to have like a lot of complicated issues around food or a lot of guilt with meals like this. And I think a Frezza does a really nice job of taking some of the guilt away because it can just nicely handle the situation better than sub-Q insulin and you're not chasing blood sugars for six hours after that. Yeah, you know, I always say in San Diego, and I think probably everywhere now, we have these things called acai bowls. And acai, to be honest, I still don't know really what it is. It's like a fruit <laughs> goop that they usually put granola on it and like honey and peanut butter and all these things that's just so hard to handle with regular insulin. 
And, you know, having a Fresa just gives you a better tool to kind of combat these things that maybe you enjoy eating, but you avoid because you don't want to kind of pay the price for it. So I'm not advocating for everyone to eat a bunch of candy and pass out. I'm just saying that a Fresa is a good tool maybe for these kind of high carb meals. Oh, yeah. And so here is, if you guys are wondering how to take it, this is Steve showing the proper technique on a Southwest flight, which God, being on a flight seems like a lifetime ago, but um, here it goes. So what's important there is you have to do the little like suggestive wink because that helps it get absorbed. And then, um, <laughs> no, but th the point here is that it's actually really easy to take. Um, it, you know, you might get funny looks because people aren't used to people inhaling insulin. They're used to actually people injecting insulin, but you know, I don't, I don't find that as a problem, but that was actually a dose. It's that easy to take. And then, you know, you're kind of on with your business. So what about these new guys, Leslie? Uh, yeah, so there are a couple faster sub-Q um, insulins available, Fias by Novo and Loomjiv by Lily that just got approved, I can't say. You come up with our own name, like Loomy, Loom. Uh, I like, I like Loomy. Um, I, you know, they have a little bit faster onset and offset, um, a little bit, you know, you, you may not spike as much when you take these insulins. I, I have not used them personally. I don't know if either of you have. Carrie, what do you think? Uh, I took, so my son is almost four and I took Fias when I was high when I was pregnant. So I always had that interest of being in range as much as possible during pregnancy and Fias wasn't in my pump, but if my blood sugar was over 160 or 170, I would use Fias to drop that sucker. So it works pretty good. And what you were talking about, the, the shorter tail on it, that was really helpful, especially after he was born because he's very fast. He's much faster than me. And having insulin that wasn't sitting active in my system for so long, that's why when you guys are talking about a Fresa sounds so good, stuff like this sounds so good because I don't want that lingering tail effect of anything that could contribute to hypoglycemia. So yeah, absolutely. I would say when you, when you think of a Fresa, it really is its own category. You know, it mm. works so fast and you kind of have to, you know, change the way that you dose it because it, it works so differently. Uh, so that's kind of good news, bad news. With these guys, they work just a little bit faster so I wouldn't change anything you were doing. It's kind of a one-to-one, -one, you know, unit-to-unit -unit ratio. I would still pre-bolus if you went on to these because they're not fast enough to just take right when you sit down and eat. So if you are going to switch over to one of these, it's a little bit easier in terms of it's everything that you've already been doing, but it's just not as a dramatic of effect as you would see with a Fresa. So Leslie, I'll just do these two quickly um, because- sure. It just shows like some of the data in terms of what I mean in terms of a little bit of a difference in, in after eating. So this was Fias versus Novolog. And they gave type ones uh, a meal and a bolus. So they gave them a, a fixed bolus right here. And then just saw what happened with their blood sugars, Fias versus Novolog. Same amount of carbs, same dose. And at one hour, Fias, their blood sugars were 21 points lower. And at two points, Fias B, but why it shouldn't be there was 12 milligrams per deciliter lower. So you can see what I mean. It's a little bit lower. It's not like, you know, a grand slam, but it might help take, you know, the, the edge off of a high. Um, you can put these in pumps. You can do it, you know, through a pump injection, whatever. So it's something to try. Um, sometimes people come back and say they really notice a difference. Sometimes people say they, they can't tell at all. So it's just something to be aware of. And this is the Loomjev data, which is similar. They did the same thing, gave type ones a meal, Loomjev versus Humalog, and at uh, one hour, there's a 28 point difference, and at two hours, 31 points difference. So you can't really compare the studies head to head. The point is that with both of these, there's a, there's a little bit less of a peak after a meal. So if you're already using a rapid acting insulin, which you are, you might consider switching or trying uh, one of these. Um, any last comments about this topic in its entirety, Leslie or Carrie? No. Okay. So I'm going to hit. So so we're, we're calling it Lumi now, though. That's a, an Loom, official thing. Loom or Loom. Loom. Okay. Yeah. Now watch. I hit this smiley face and look. See what happens <laughs> right back there. Wow. All right. So number one is the longest one, but I think that's a really important one because we, we covered, um, you know, potentially doing low carb, pre bolusing, splitting your meals, um, new insulins with the Fresa, Loomjet, Fiesta. There's a lot of things because. 
this might be one of the things that bothers type ones the most. I go high after meals, it drives me nuts. What can I do? So I think it was appropriate to spend a lot of time on that. But Carrie, take us to number yeah. two. Well, that's the thing. I am going to go with number two because we've spent so much time talking about being high that it seems only right to move towards discussions about being low. Yep. So that, I'm going with number two. And that really is the problem with type one, right? If we could just give ourselves a ton of insulin and just bring it down all the time, great. But you got to worry about the other side. So what is the other side? I'm low all the time. Is that bad for me? So is this one me, Leslie, or you? Uh, it's you. Okay. So this is somebody doing a limbo competition, going low. All right. So let me get rid of my face for a second. So here's another <laughs> continuous glucose monitor um, download. And what you can see here is that quickly you can look that this person's average blood sugar over the actual last 14 days is 98 super tight, super, you know, low blood sugar. Um, their estimated A1C from this is 5.7. And when you look at this though, their time and range is, is appropriate, but they have a total of 24% of the time that they're low. That means about, um, what, six hours a day, they're less than 70. And the thing about this is this person has probably been getting a pat on their back from the endocrinologist for years. You're my best patient, your A1C is 5.7. You know, that's awesome. And even with a good A1C though, you can have, you can be in an unsafe place. I would much rather have this person be an A1C of 6.7 or, or 7.2 even with, with no hypoglycemia. So you have to remember that balance. It's, it's very, very important. Um, a lot of times people that have this type of setup will just be people that are afraid of hyperglycemia or they wanna avoid being high at all costs and they can constantly be giving themselves insulin to kind of drive their blood sugars down. And it's, it's an unsafe place. I'm actually much more worried about this patient than somebody with an A1C of nine, um, because this person is the one that can get in a car accident or have a seizure. So um, a good A1C can kind of hide sins, if you will. So the interpretation here is the A1C is great. There's low variability, the standard deviation is 34. The hypos are a huge problem. And I would spend my whole visit kind of talking with this patient about, you know, the, the, the concern with hypoglycemia. So when this happens, one thing that you need to do is look at alert settings. And here you can see that this person has their low alarm set at 65 and the low repeat is off. These low alarms are there for a reason, you know, so I have mine set at 80. Um, because I want to catch, you know, my blood sugar going low and do something about it to give myself more of a buffer before I'm, you know, 45 and confused and sweaty and all those kinds of things. So, um, I don't know, Leslie, Carrie, what do you guys do with your low alarms? Do you set them to certain places or do you adjust them over time? I have mine set at 75 with, with repeat, but I think 80 makes sense too. Um, it's just a matter of giving yourself time to react to it. I think if I had somebody like this in clinic, I would just be really worried about their hypoglycemia unawareness. You know, they probably aren't feeling lows if they've, you know, had numbers like this for, for months. And I think some people are completely dependent on their CGM to feel their lows for them um, and, and give them a heads up that they're dropping. And this technology is not 100% too, you know? And so it worries me that if something, if they were traveling or something happened to their CGM um, and they weren't able to get a new sensor back on, how, how things would go, you know? Yeah, and I think um, the low repeat or the repeat alarms in general is something that's important. So if you have that off, that means that let's say you go to 65 and your alert goes off, it will never alert you again. Even if you go down to you know 30 or 20 or whatever, if you have that repeat on, it'll let you know 15 minutes later, and that's what I have my low repeat set on, I think, hey, you're still low, you know, even if you drink carbs or whatever, you've got to do something else about it. So you don't want it to tell you just once, especially on the low side, because you might still be low. So that repeat feature is, is important. All right, so this particular patient, I just wanted to bring in here because there are other kind of medical things you can do to help avoid lows. Um, this patient switched to the tandem control IQ, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, but it has a couple features. One being that it will actually suspend insulin if your blood sugar starts to go low. So if it predicts in the next 30 minutes that you're going to drop below 80, it'll actually suspend your insulin delivery. And then this is her more recent um, continuous glucose monitor report. 
we can see her average blood sugar actually increased and she was upset about this, you know, even with an average of 116, which is still amazing. But sometimes again, people can get in their head that they have to be quote unquote perfect. And her time and range is still great. Her total time low is now 12%, still higher than I would like, but way better than 25%. Um, and the reason or a reason that her blood sugars or she's had less lows is on this next page where what's shown here is the blood sugars over, you know, 24 hours. And this here is the basal rate. So anytime that, you know, these little things come up here, it's giving her more insulin. When it comes down, it's giving less. And importantly, these red things are when it's actually suspended insulin completely. And you can see in just this one example day, there's, I don't know, 12 or 13 or so times that this pump is actually suspending insulin, this time's for like an hour or so, to help avoid hypoglycemia, or if she goes hypoglycemic, help to allow her to recover. So these type of systems are one way that people can really help to minimize hypoglycemia. I don't know, Leslie or Carrie, if you guys want to talk about systems that you're on or what your thoughts about this. Yeah, go ahead, Carrie. Uh, well, I, by way of really quick disclosure, so I have a relationship um, as a sponsorship relationship with Dexcom, with um, Tandem Diabetes. And so I wear Control IQ. They sponsor me and I've done some speaking on their behalf. Um, and this conference is one of those events. So just kind of throwing that out there in full disclosure. But those red bars that show up when the pump is turned off, every time I see those, you know how sometimes you, you will see a range of them. So if you look at the 24 hour range, you just see a bunch of red bars. I'm like, yes. This is exactly what I want because this system is doing the thinking for me. I don't have to sweat out these lows or even endure them for so long because it's shutting off and helping reduce the uh, impact of those lows on my day to day in such a, such a large way that like, I don't mind wearing a pump. I don't mind wearing a CGM. I don't mind having these discussions because it's doing, it's taking that, that diabetes fear off of the front burner and putting it on the back. And after having type one for 34 years, that's kind of like a first for that. <laughs> so I think there's some magic in there. Bias, been, bias, bias, bias. <laughs> yeah, I've been on Control IQ since um, December, and I would agree it's just sort of taken um, a lot of the burden away. It becomes something that's kind of often, not always, but maybe more often than previously shifted to the back of your mind. And, and now seeing people in clinic who have been on it now for three, four, five months, all of these visits have been just really um, happy. People are feel like a weight has been lifted many times. Their overnight data is incredible. They're waking up at just the same number every single morning, which for many people is just half the battle. If you can wake up with a decent number in the morning, you're so much more likely to then be set up for success for the rest of the day. Yeah, you know, and I didn't think about this before the talk, but I'm also on the Control IQ, so all three of us are. Hey. And um, yeah, it's made a huge difference. And you're right, Leslie, I see these patients and um, you know, a lot of people come in, not everybody, but I'm like, man, you should be telling me what to do because your blood sugars are doing good. And so it's, it's something, it's a system, first system I've seen that's really truly made a difference. I'm not talking about just CGN, but I'm talking about an integrated system. Um, so it, more to come on this, but for this particular patient, it was the, the hypo side that was really important. Other patients, it's the hyper, some it's both. So it's, it's, it's a big step forward, I think. Um, in this same kind of um, area, since we're talking about hypoglycemia, we have to talk about new updates in glucagon. So hopefully everybody knows that glucagon is the hormone that raises your blood sugar, insulin brings you down. Forever we've had this glucagon recovery kit that if you were having a severe low, a seizure, you would take out this, it was like a little tiny red suitcase, open it up, and then you had to mix like the, the powder with this, a liquid and you had to shake it and you know draw it back up and then inject it it's not that but not you, what's somebody that? else but not you, you're not doing this you're somebody not supposed to do it. it's supposed to be <laughs> someone around you because you're you know having a seizure and it's not complicated but if somebody is having a seizure in front of you it becomes super complicated um yeah. and a really intense situation carrie i remember one time i had to give glucagon to that person that, when you were there um mm -hmm. and even though i'm a trained medical provider it's my hands were shaking and everything but anyways um, so now there's a couple different options. There's um, a, a nasal uh, glucagon that you actually just put in the person's uh, nose and kind of squirt it. They don't have to take a big breath in or whatever, so they can be unconscious, but it's all preloaded. You just squeeze it. There's a pre-filled syringe um, that is a stable glucagon in a, in a liquid formulation. So there's no mixing anything like that. You just, you can inject the whole dose if somebody's having a seizure. This one, because it is in a little syringe, you could actually microdose if you want. 
So if you were having, you know, a bad low, but you couldn't eat anymore or whatever, you could just give yourself a little bit, maybe a half a dose. And the same company just now uh, is releasing this auto injector pen, which is like an EpiPen that you don't even see the needle. You kind of put it down, push the button and it delivers the dose. So that's, you know, these are, the point is, these are all much easier ways to deliver glucagon in this high intensity um, situation. So every single person with type one diabetes should have some form of glucagon at home in the fridge. And the second part of that is they need to teach somebody how to use it, a loved one, a friend or whatever, because the idea is it's there for you when you can't treat yourself. So guys, any comments on this or? Yeah, I, I have a lot of commentary on the uh, Baxemi, on the nasal glucagon, because for my family, this was the least intimidating option for my team. So to explain to my 10 year old that if I was feeling like a garbage can and it was because of a low blood sugar, that this was something that she could help me with in a way that didn't intimidate her the same way that a needle did, took the heat off of a lot of those conversations I've had in the past where I've had to explain to teachers or coworkers or people I was dating or whatever else, how to use that red suitcase with the reconstituted glucagon in it. So that just made Lowe's seem a little less scary and assisting mom in a time when she needed help really a lot less intimidating. I haven't tried the GVOKE. I'm stoked about that. I love the idea of being able to <clears throat> microdose glucagon in order to fix, uh, fix lows. I know a lot of people during pregnancy find ways to sort of do a workaround there with the reconstituted glucagon, but that's a really powerful way to be managing the intense lows of the first trimester. But I mean, back me just is not scary. So anything that makes something already scary, a little less scary, sounds like a really good idea. Uh, that's and I've tried it. Nothing yeah. burns, but it works. <laughs> I've heard it burns. Ugh. Yeah, it's kind of why you're like, oh, I'm just going to put it on my, oh my God, like it's shocking to the system, but then you're better soon. And that's pretty awesome. Um, thanks for that, Carrie. That's a, that's a point I hadn't <laughs> thought about, but you're right. You want, yeah, you said it all. But this, um, this slide I'm going to try to explain because I think it's important. So again, the, the people that I find clinically that have a lot of problems with hypoglycemia, are these people that have had it beaten into them that anytime their blood sugar goes over 160, that they're, they're going to go blind or their kidneys are going to fail or something like that. And it requires a, a, a change in mindset of, you know, that you can live a long and healthy life without having, you know, quote unquote, perfect blood sugars. So this is a very simple slide, but it makes a, a powerful point that what they've done now is they've followed people with type one diabetes for, for decades and compared them to people without type one diabetes in terms of how long they live. And that this dotted line here represents is that at about an A1C of eight and a half or so, that people with type one diabetes tend to live just as long as people without diabetes. So yes, as people's A1Cs went up to nine, 10, 11, 12, they were more likely to pass away sooner. But as their A1C became lower than eight and a half, they found that type ones were actually living longer than people without diabetes. So the bottom line here is that if you control your blood sugars, do the best you can, the odds are you'll live a long and healthy life. Now, this is different than, than complications. You know, perhaps these people with an A1C of eight were living longer, but maybe had some eye complications. Um, so those things don't always go hand in hand. But I just have to remind people all the time that, you know, if you keep your blood sugars down less than seven, you know, or so, not to be too morbid, but you're going to die of something else. And that's a life goal for people with type one, you know, that we would be so blessed to, you know, die of something non-diabetes related. So I don't know if you guys have any thoughts about that. Speech. You said it all. I'm not sure how to follow that kind of commentary, but it does seem to go along the lines of uh, Bill Polanski's discussion about evidence-based hope. I like seeing evidence that there's something to look forward to and that there's reasons to feel hopeful. I'm very into that. So that slide's pretty awesome. All right. Thanks, Gary. So learning points in this one, get out of your head about being high, blood sugar wise, type ones are living longer than ever, very important. Um, even with a good A1C, you can be in this is in a not safe place, meaning that um, if your A1C is 5.7, but you're spending half the time hypoglycemic, that's not ideal. Um, use technology um, to help reduce uh, hypos. We all just mentioned that we're on the control IQ system, a great tool. New glucagon formulations are available. Um, three of them, and we've gone decades with the same thing, and all of a sudden there's this boom in glucagon formulations. So be aware of them, ask your provider about them, teach a loved one how to use it. And then again, setting your low alert at 80 or so. Um, you know, the, the low alert is not there to bother you, it's there to save your life. 
That being said, it, it can be annoying. Um, certainly don't get rid of it. Oops, let me go back one. Oh, I have one more comment about the, the vaccine. Just quickly, I think when it first came out, I was really excited about it and talking to people about it and prescribing it a lot. And several times, like more than five times, we would get a kickback from insurance saying that they needed to fail the IM glucagon, like the, the old shot yeah. prior to them approving vaccine, which, you know, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, but even if, so if, you're, if your provider prescribes one of the newer glucagons and it's rejected, um, still work with your provider. There's a way, like, you know, every time I've sent a follow-up letter citing how much more effective it's been able to be used by someone, um, and that letter has, has allowed that newer form of glucagon to be approved every single time. So yeah. one rejection yeah. means that you can't, cannot get it. And there's, a lot, I think all of them have like these copay cards too, which can be really cool. They do. And they sometimes, the vaccine has a two pack too, so you can keep, you know, um, you can have uh, uh, one of the nose sprays in, in uh, two different places. And I think the copay card is like $25 for the, the two pack. Um, all right, I don't know if we're gonna have time for the basal rate, but Carrie, what do you say between fat and protein and alcohol? Are you guys gonna do a lightning round or are you gonna- Yeah, we'll probably go through these two quickly. All right, well, why don't you start with bolusing for fat and protein and then roll into the drinks. Okay, fat and protein. All right. Which makes me so unexciting because I just did them all in order. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, all right, so this, this picture here is supposed to represent the mental calculus that all of us have to do on a meal by meal basis of how many carbs you had, how much protein, how much fat, when you last exercised, how stressed you are, how much caffeine you have in your system, how well you slept with or without your CPAP, all, whatever else goes into you know, the calculations we have to make is, is crazy. Um, but fat and protein is something that we often don't think about. So Leslie, are you running this one or me? Yeah, I, uh, sure, I can, yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, this is somebody who's about to have a giant ribeye. It's a lot of calories, no carbs. And <laughs> that's an Omaha steak. This is like, this is like a mid morning snack for most. <laughs> most. <laughs> um, so this is a lot of fat, this is 63 grams of fat. Uh, but no carbs. So you may be inclined to think that you just don't have to give any insulin. Um, and things probably won't go well if that's what happens. You know, I What's can, next? do you want me to explain this? You can explain this one, sure. And I, I think to, to your point is that there's no free meal. You know, if you ate that, that steak and you didn't bolus for it, your blood sugar wouldn't go up immediately. But by like 10 p.m., 11 p.m., you're going to be three, 400 because everything eventually turns into glucose. So even yep. if you eat super low carb, um, if you eat a thousand calorie steak, your blood sugar is gonna go up. So this was a really cool study that's very kind of simple but elegant. And what they did is they took a bunch of type ones and had them bolus for a pizza, but the only thing that was on the pizza was the dough and the sauce. So they took a, took a certain dose for the, the exact amount of carbs in that pizza. And this is what happened to their blood sugar. They went from 100 to maybe 180 and then back down to you know, 100 or so. And then they took that same amount of carbs, the same dough, the same amount of sauce, and they added the cheese to the pizza and found that if you bolus for the same amount of carbs that you're eating, but you just add cheese, you know, this, this fat and protein that doesn't really have any carbs, that your blood sugar goes up. And specifically, it's after about two hours that you start absorbing that, that fat and protein and then your blood sugar stays up you know, high. And anybody that's ever eaten pizza, myself included, this is exactly what happens. Your blood sugars are like fine for the first hour and you're like, oh, I nailed that bolus. And then you're like mm -hmm. off the races and, and high for you know, the foreseeable future. Um, so that difference was 115 milligrams per decilitre, 115 points difference at the end of you know, 360 minutes just by adding fat and protein. Um, and you can see the amount of fat and protein that each of these had. Then they did this like optimized insulin dose where they tried to think of the timing of, you know, when you should increase your, your bolus or whatever it might be. Because people always ask, how much should I bolus for fat and protein? How much of an extended bolus should I do? And we really don't know is kind of the bottom line. Um, but the, we do know that when you eat large amounts of fat and protein, again, it's absorbed slowly. So your blood sugars will go up, but it's usually about two hours after you eat and it can stay up for three, four, sometimes five hours. And they found in general that people, when they added the, the cheese and the, and the, again, the fat and the protein, they needed about 65% or so more insulin for the same amount of carbs. So if you just add that, you just need to, you know, a substantial amount more of insulin. And um, the duration of time that their blood sugars would, was elevated, was extended. 
And they found that an ideal split of, you know, kind of bullish to, to over this, this duration was a 30 to 70% ratio, meaning 30% of their bullish up front, 70% over the next three hours or so. But there was a big range between patients. Some was 10 to 90, some was 50, 50. Again, the range of people that needed more insulin was 17 to 124%. So at the end of the day, it's almost impossible to say, um, do this every time you eat fat and protein because it's different for different people. It's different on the days, you know, and I want to hear from our panel. These are some, some recommendations that basically if you're going to eat a large fat protein, increase your, your total amount of insulin by 30%, give the bolus over two to three hours, start with 30% initially and give the other 70% over two to three hours. What I do is I do my best with the initial bolus and I just look at my CGM and I give myself more insulin as I need it. Um, depending on if it's going up or what's happening. And uh, pizza usually still wins, to be honest. Um, but uh, the control IQ and these things can help. But as long as you understand that you're going to be needing more insulin, you know, farther out from your meal, then you can understand that, yeah, I'm going to have to give myself these little taps with, with rapid acting insulin. And I don't care. Do you have, how do you eat pizza? Do you eat pizza? Oh. I just like filled with hope and usually over bolusing because that's generally how it works. I don't like to be high and I really try to avoid it. So when it comes to stuff like this, I tend to over calculate how much I'm actually eating and I end up low. So now after you've had a piece or two of pizza and you're super full, then you have to go and mainline a couple of juice boxes and that's usually a bad combo. So I don't eat a lot of pizza. <laughs> what about you, Leslie? I had a horrible fail with the Frezza and pizza when I first started using it where I like took it at the time of the meal but then you get that delayed rise and so yeah you're low as you're eating pizza and it, it's it's I don't pizza pizza usually wins uh, but I think this is why you know a lot of like fast food restaurants or fast casual restaurants are now posting their nutritional information like in the store you can find it online um, and sometimes that gives us a false sense of security because you know, you think you know exactly how many carbs are in the meal. And so that's what you put in. Um, but then that usually doesn't work, right? Because these meals are usually so much higher in, in fat compared to when we're eating at home. So. And, you know, pizza is the, the prime example, but it's Chinese food. It's anything with, you know, a lot of cheese yeah. or, or protein or whatever. It's honestly most dinners. Um, yep. that even if you get, you know, that initial thing kind of right, you, you might get a, a, a spike after eating. So it's just something mostly to be aware of. And people are frustrated that there's not an exact calculation for it. Um, but you just got to do your best. And I'm mortified that I raised my hand on a Zoom call, but I'm raising it again because I have noticed. So uh, in the last couple of years, I've added a GLP-1 to my regimen of things that I'm doing to help control my diabetes. And I found that issues like these are less severe. I, I see fewer of the like crazy spikes using that medication. It just has helped kind of even out, even in the spots where I'm completely screwing it up. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's a great example. Another thing that I hope we have time to talk about. But key messages is that protein and fat, they get absorbed slower and it eventually requires some insulin use. Um, expect to see the effect from one to two hours after eating much delayed compared to carbs. So again, it's just something else that we have to think about. You know, I think people try to simplify insulin dosing to insulin to carbs. And as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, I was being a little bit funny, but there's all these other things. Again, when you exercise your stress level and fat and protein is absolutely one of them. And I find that sometimes just simply knowing this, that fat and protein turn into sugar can help people to understand and be less frustrated when they do see these spikes, you know, coming kind of later. All right, I'm gonna push my happy face, which means we're going to alcohol. Look at this guy, hey. having a good time. He's, you know, got a tie in his head, the universal sign for having a good time. Um, so, um, you know, Leslie or Carrie, do you want to set this like topic up maybe in terms of what you ever were told or not told in terms of alcohol with diabetes or, or how, how have you learned, Carrie, maybe you're best to kind of tell us about that. How have you learned about <laughs> alcohol's effect on your blood sugars? Uh, there were two things that I was always told. That, well, three things. The first was not to drink any alcoholic drinks that had a lot of sugar in them. So don't drink mixed drinks like uh, pina coladas or stuff like that. So setting myself up for chaos. The second thing was if I drank anything like wine or beer, that it would potentially make me high at the outset and then it was going to drop me super low. So in college and that sort of stuff, my endocrinologist was always like, listen, if this is something that you're doing, make sure you're eating before you go to bed so that you don't tank. And then the third thing was that glucagon was not going to work while I was uh, drinking or 
if I happen to be drunk or something like that. And so all three of those things have been completely mashed up and reworked as I've gotten older. So I think this is where the person with diabetes needs to turn it over to the clinicians with diabetes because you need to walk me through the truth of this. Yeah, well, I think that's great because the point I was hoping to make is that usually people aren't told anything. That's because one, as <laughs> providers, we don't really know what to say. Two, you know, people with diabetes are embarrassed to ask. And at best, you generally get like a blanket statement, like alcohol lowers your blood sugar, alcohol raises your blood sugar. And you're just left wondering, well, what the hell does it do? Um, and part of the problem is, look at every single alcoholic drink you drink, you'll never find a nutrition label because it's not required, except on these like new, like low calorie white claws and stuff where they intentionally put the calories on there because they're low carb. But otherwise, you, you, won't, you don't know what you're putting in your body. So Leslie, what are your thoughts? Uh, I mean, I didn't have diabetes in college, so uh, I got to skate through that one. But no, I mean, I got no information about it as a patient ever. Uh, and it was just, it's a lot, of, a lot of trial and error. Yeah. Well, I'll talk about this chart I made, which is super sophisticated and um, takes a lot of time to go through. But this is basically me showing the effect of these different types of alcohol on my blood sugar. And the point to make here is that the effect on your blood sugar is very dependent on the specific type of alcohol that you're drinking. Because when you drink just straight up hard alcohol shots, or even just hard alcohol mixed with like a zero calorie beverage, like a rum and diet Coke, that the effect of alcohol itself will lower your blood sugar. However, on the other end of the spectrum, foofy drinks that are, you know, high, you know, like margaritas with a lot of sweetener, like whatever put in those things, there's a lot of sugar in that mixer and that'll definitely raise your blood sugar. So it really matters. Are you drinking foofy drinks all night or shots or what? And wine, wine is actually pretty neutral. Sometimes just drinking wine will actually lower your blood sugar a little bit. So it's, it's actually very friendly, a very friendly thing to drink for uh, diabetes. Beer is also kind of hard, especially as you get into like these hoppier beers. Um, they can be 30, you know, 35 grams of carbs. Um, so you have to know what you're drinking. If, you, if you're a wine drinker, just look up what your favorite Chardonnay is, see how many carbs are in it. If you're a beer drinker, look that up. Um, and if you drink foofy drinks, you don't have to stay away from them completely, but maybe go to kind of a lower cal uh, calorie or a skinny version or something like that. So let me go to the next slide. All right. I'll just go through this quickly. So knowing the calories is important, knowing the car or the carbs is important. The effect of alcohol on your blood sugar, which I already mentioned, brings your blood sugar down, typically actually overnight or maybe even to the next day, depending on how much you actually drink. Um, and then the effect of alcohol on medications, we're not gonna talk so much about, but in generally it's not a good idea to kind of mix things. So this is meant to be a quiz and you guys kind of following along online can, can kind of enter your comments, but how many carbs, calories in a beer and what do you think in terms of how many calories, how many carbs? Um, take some guesses, but this is a Budweiser. So starting with kind of American traditional beer, I haven't had a Budweiser in a, in a, in a minute, but um, so 145 calories, 10 grams of carbs. And this is kind of a traditional, this would be a Budweiser, a Coors, um, a Miller, all those things. Every one of those you drink, 10 carbs, not too bad, 145 calories, those can add up but just not like a huge, you know, carb wallop. Um, but uh, what about calories, carbs, and good beer? So, you know, this has been kind of a beer revolution across the country, um, Omaha for sure, San Diego, East Coast, everywhere. And the movement has been to these bigger, hoppier IPAs, high alcohol content. Um, so in general, like an IPA will have 220 calories or so, that's a lot per 12 ounces and 20 grams of carbs. So if you drink two of those, that's like downing a, a can of Pepsi. And that's definitely going to make your blood sugars go up. It might, you know, bring your blood sugars down slowly over time because of the alcohol, but the immediate effect is going to be to actually raise your blood sugar. Glass of wine, good buttery Chardonnay. Again, very friendly to drink. Um, five grams of carbs really won't have much of an impact at all. People are kind of surprised by that. It doesn't really matter if it's white wine or red wine. They're very low carb, very low calorie, very good option for people with diabetes. And what about a shot of hard alcohol? Doesn't matter if it's uh, whiskey or rum or vodka. The answer is, is zero grams of carbs. So people are shocked when I say the best thing to drink diabetes wise is just shots. Um, you know, it's the quickest way to get, you know, kind of um, to get drunk. But um, in terms of blood sugars, it's the most friendly. 
And you can mix these again with low calorie things to, to really be kind of a carb friendly option. So really hard alcohol with, with low calorie mixers, low carb mixers and wine are probably the best thing to drink with diabetes. And by the way, the ADA recommends that people with diabetes, women should only have one drink a day and men should only have two drinks a day. And I always say these aren't rollover minutes. You know, you can't just because you didn't drink one day, like accrue them. So on the weekend, you can just like go for it. It's kind of per day. So I don't know, Leslie, Carrie, do you guys have, have you gravitated? I think you guys are more kind of wine drinkers. Leslie, I know you like beer, but how do you, what's your approach to alcohol? I guess I should ask. Carrie, do you want to start? Sure, all the, sure. <laughs> I've taken all the awkward stuff. First of all, I want to know, I only like Fireball. So does Fireball have a lot of carbs in it or does that just fall into the, because I generally don't drink much at all, but when I do, I would prefer wine. But the thing about alcohol that has not been mentioned yet isn't just the effect that it has on your blood sugars, but it's the effect that it has on your brain in managing the math of diabetes. So if I have a glass or two of wine, I'm feeling pretty good, but at the same time, I'm not able to keep a good grasp on what's going on blood sugar wise. So that's just something that we haven't talked about yet, but I think needs to be dropped in there as like a little fireball shot of wisdom to make sure that you have someone that can keep an eyeball on you when you're doing your shots of all kinds. <laughs> that's a great, sure. you know, I don't know if I have a slide that I, I have in here or not, but I always tell people, make sure to do all your diabetes related tasks if possible before you start drinking. So if you have an infusion <laughs> set that you need to change, don't wait till, you know, you come to it home at 2 a.m. Oh. to forget about it or your basal insulin shot, take that before you go out. Try to protect yourself from drunk you as much as possible. And <laughs> have, a, have a drinking buddy, meaning somebody that knows that you have diabetes and that if you, you know, are intoxicated or God forbid pass out or something, they can't mm -hmm. just leave you alone. You know, they need to check on your blood sugars and make sure that you're okay. So sorry, Leslie, I cut you off. What were you gonna say? Oh no, um, usually my patients who are going to college, it's, you know, just talking about making sure their roommate, um, knows about their diabetes, making sure that their roommate knows about glucagon, making sure if they're on a CGM that they're sharing their CGM data with somebody, not just their mom, like five states away, but somebody in their, in their dorm room, if that's possible, like an RA maybe. Um, I, I guess personally, I, I don't tend to bolus for wine. I don't usually really need to bolus. Um, beer is kind of a mixed bag. I think like microbrewery beer is really hard because you just, have no idea what's in it. Um, we've been making a lot more cocktails during uh, our COVID quarantine, and so I've been uh, that's, that's new territory for me. So I've been trying to figure that out. But yeah, it all depends on what what mixer is um, okay. is in the spirit. I think that's important. Don't bolus for wine. Don't bolus for hard alcohol. Definitely bolus for beer. Um, you know, especially these like these higher carb ones. Maybe a little bit less than you would for the total carb count because the alcohol will eventually bring you down. And the foofy drinks, you definitely have to bolus for. So just to bring yeah. this point home, in one pina colada, and I know there's two shown here, 526 calories, 61 grams of carbs. And God bless pina coladas, I love them. Um, <laughs> but it's just like Carrie said, mainlining juice. <laughs> so um, it's hard to handle. And just to not to upset people, but when you're sitting by the pool feeling sexy, you know, drinking one of these, um, it's basically like eating one of these guys because a Big Mac is, you know, 550 calories, 46 grams of carbs. Um, and you absolutely would bolus for a Big Mac, right? And you would know that you were kind of going for it in terms of what you're eating and putting in your body. So just being aware of what you're eating or drinking is important. Um, Steve a while ago did a, a, an element report where he made these like low calorie pina coladas um, using uh, a buy, I forget, always forget what it is, um, blending it up, 40 calories, four carbs. Um, so there are delicious things that you can make that are low calorie. Same thing with margaritas or whatever you like. There's generally an alternative to it. Um, what is behind the computer screen? Are we not addressing <laughs> that? What is that? Well, it's a Chewbacca head. Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're saying all these, you know, things that are really going to help people manage their diabetes, but I can't focus on what you're saying based on the fact that that's on the screen. So thank you. <laughs> that's all yeah. I wanted to know. No, that's actually Chewbacca. It's not a mask. Nice. Yeah. He really nice. <laughs> Um, so bottom line for, for alcohol is that the effect of carbs will raise your blood sugar, but the effect of the alcohol will lower your blood sugar. So this becomes a problem overnight. So, you know, the alcohol generally will lower your blood sugar kind of overnight. And that's where people can get into problems. 
So what you don't want to do is go out to a party or whatever. You come home, your blood sugar is 250, take a huge bolus and then go to bed. Um, you know, I say when you're drinking, allow your blood sugars to be a little bit higher, 180, 200 or whatever or so to avoid hypoglycemia. Because when you're, you know, drunk or drinking, you don't feel your lows as much. You're not as likely to respond to a continuous glucose monitor. So if it's a time that you're really drinking, going to a party, allow yourself to kind of ride a little bit higher to avoid problems with hypoglycemia, especially overnight. So key messages to drinking successfully. Always eat something before drinking. I always say God made pizza and beer for a reason. Um, they kind of tag team up well. You've got the beer bringing your blood sugar down overnight, but you got the fat and the protein kind of going up. It's a nice combination. Avoid sugary mixed drinks. Don't eliminate them, but just know that you're in for a ride. Um, and then when you bolus for alcohol, I have this general rule, you know, bolus for the carbs with half what you normally would. Um, that will make you kind of, again, write a little bit higher. Um, you don't want you writing high your whole life, but for when you're drinking, that's totally fine. Test a lot for drinking, while drinking, before bed. Um, hopefully you have a continuous glucose monitor um, because that's always the way to go. And then, like I said before, take your basal insulin before you go out, um, change your infusion set, all these kinds of things. So any final comments on this topic, guys? Yeah, one quick question. Does glucagon work if you're drunk? It does. So that's a common thing that people will ask, you know, glucagon works on the liver and so does alcohol. But when you take a glucagon rescue kit, you're taking such a huge wallop that it overpowers the, the alcohol. And the bottom line is if you're in a situation you need glucagon, you know, take it. Um, all right. So I know we went over time a little bit, so we might have to parse this out and put some of it online or whatever. Um, but I think this is a lot of good information to cover for sure. And you know, the three of us don't have all the answers. And I think a, a take home point is that you educate yourself, you try to learn these tips and tricks so that you have some tools to fight the highs, the lows and everything in between alcohol, pizza, these things that we battle all the time. Um, but you guys have been great. Any kind of final things that you wanted to impart words of wisdom on our, our folks listening? So I'm, I'm just hoping that by running through a lot of these scenarios in a really real world sort of way that this gives people the confidence to go and ask their clinicians about the specifics. So maybe they hadn't talked about alcohol with their endocrinologist before. This is going to be that conversation starter of, oh yeah, that's right. I don't have the background on that. I want to go and ask. So everybody's watching at home. I hope that you are taking these little nuggets. And if you want to expand on them, that you're going to go and talk to your specific clinical team to get like a full picture. Lovely. Yeah, I guess from a provider perspective, there's just so much to focus on in a 20 minute return office visit. So it's really nice to hear from your patients what's important to them or kind of what do they specifically want to address during that appointment. There's so much um, new that's come out over the last year, whether it be hybrid closed loops and what's coming in the pipeline, different forms of glucagon, tips and tricks on pre-bolusing. So um, it's really it's really nice to know kind of what's um, in the forefront of, of your patient's mind to know, you know what to address each visit. Yeah, and I think it's great to not have enough time to cover all this stuff. Because, you know, if we did this talk five years ago, right. we have any of these new products to be talking about. So a lot changes and a lot changes quickly. And it's hard for even the providers to keep up with, not because they're bad or dumb. It's just there's a lot going on. So if you come with them with, you know, hey, I heard about this, this new comp or whatever, it'll make that appointment more, more impactful, I think. So um, absolutely so i guess we're going to do some some questions and um go from there all right so thanks panelists appreciate it um i'm now live at the tcoid office you know fitting to my last talk you can see for research purposes i have my my alcohol over here for research um so i just wanted to answer a few of the questions that came up you know in the comments and the, the q a um, there was a ton of questions around Afreza, which I think is is great because I still think this is a very underutilized medication. It's one that people don't know a lot about. So I'll, I'll make a few comments, but you know, during the break, you can go to different exhibitors to, to see these things. And Afreza is made by Mankind. So if you click on Mankind, um, you will see the representatives, uh, Chloe and Hunter. Hunter has type one himself talking more about Afreza. So, um, specifically, the questions were around Afreza and use with pumps, um, and then a little bit with these hybrid closed loop systems like Control IQ. So, 
you know, I've used a Frezza with a pump for a long time and I find it, it actually works really well to take a Frezza at the start of the meal for any carbs that you might be bolusing for. And then you can actually bolus a few units through the pump to maybe deal with the fat and protein later in the meal. Now, with the, the hybrid closed loop systems like Control IQ, for example, it can work really well. Like, you know, so you can take the Afrezo right at the beginning of the meal, and then the Control IQ system might, you know, actually kind of cover the tail end of the meal with a micro bolus if it needs to, or increasing the basal rate. So that works really well intermittently. It can become a problem if you're using Afrezo all the time, um, because then the pump will see that you're, it'll think you're very insulin sensitive because your total daily dose through the pump will be really low because it can't see what you're giving yourself through a Frezza. So it does change the algorithm in terms of how aggressive it is. So you just kind of, I would say, still just play with it. If you're on one of these systems, as I mentioned, I'm on Control IQ and still use a Frezza intermittently and get really good um, results. So that was definitely um, one thing that kind of came up a lot. Another thing, was around um, these newer glucagon formulations, how long they're quote unquote good for, you know, if they're stable, all these types of things. Um, all excellent questions again. Um, so, you know, I think big picture that there's two different issues. You know, we're told how long something's good for and then we kind of want to know how long it's actually good for. And I made some comments in the Q&A that, you know, we're usually told that insulin is good for a month um, and that's, really not true. So please do not throw out your insulin after a month. If you keep it in the fridge, it's good for, you know, probably years, to be honest, um, because the insulin is very stable. Glucagon, you know, it used to come in a little powder and it was, you know, very stable. You could have it at room temperature, things like that. I believe the Baxini, the nasal one can also be at room temperature. To be honest, I need to get a little bit more info on the, on the, the Xeris products, the Gvoke pen or, or the, the pre-filled syringe. All these companies also have booths here, so you can stop by Xeris with an X, X-E-R-I-S, to learn about the new injectable forms of glucagon. And then Lily makes the nasal one, uh, Baximi. Bottom line is everybody should have some glucagon. There was a comment also, you live alone, should I have glucagon? Yes, um, because with certain ones of these, you can actually give yourself a, a, you know, a mini dose or a micro dose. I've had to do that to myself once when I accidentally um, took my bolus insulin that I thought was my basal, if you could believe that. So I took a crap ton of bolus insulin and I just couldn't eat anymore. So eventually took a little bit of glucagon to bring my blood sugars, you know, back up. So everybody should have glucagon and we have options now. So it behooves you to kind of learn about what might be the best one. All these new glucagons are, are new kids on the block. So they usually have like copay cards and things to help with, you know, getting around insurance. Um, which is my next topic that I, that I should mention that, you know, obviously in this world that we're living right now, COVID-19, people have lost jobs, have lost insurances. Um, Lily, L-I-L-L-Y, has a very good kind of patient assistance program that you should check out that can help lower co-pays um, to make sure that everyone can still get insulin, which unfortunately in 2020 is still a problem. Insulin is expensive. Um, and, you know, the last thing you want to have to be dealing with right now is, is, is not having access to that. Um, so there was a, few, a lot of questions about, um, uh, hypoglycemia. Is it bad for you? Um, so yes, it, it, it doesn't feel great. Nobody likes being hypoglycemic, but people want to know, is it doing brain damage? And the short answer really is, is no, that when we've looked into this, you know, most type ones have two, three you know, or more hypos a week, usually in the mild form. Um, and those don't seem to, you know, kill brain cells or at least affect, you know, cognition, anything down the, down the road. People worried, am I going to be mentally impaired, have Alzheimer's, et cetera. There's, there really hasn't been a link to that. The main issue with recurrent hypos is it makes you unaware to those hypos. And your body literally stops fighting back over time. That if we look at how much adrenaline type ones produce when they're first kind of diagnosed in response to a hypoglycemic episode, it's a lot. And then with frequent hypo episodes, you start producing less. So your body is just not trying to raise your blood sugar as much as it can, which makes you more predisposed to a bad low. So really the main risk of hypoglycemia is more hypoglycemia. So, you know, it's not good news. I, mean, I suppose there's a little bit of good news. Like, you know, don't worry that every time you get a low that you're, you know, going to end up in, you know, a care facility or something. That's not going to happen. You just have to be, you know, really aware of these lows. Um, there's some, some questions about the, the newer insulins too. So, you know, I think we didn't talk about it, you know, specifically, but if you're on shots, I don't know if we mentioned, you know, Traceba and Tuget are new basal insulins that, that actually aren't that new anymore. They've been around for a couple of years. 
They're better in terms of less hypoglycemia, more predictable. You don't have to take two doses a day, one dose will do it. So those new basal insulins, you can generally get through insurance. The newer rapid acting insulins, this Lumjev or Lumi that we're calling it, literally got approved like, like a month ago. Um, so that one I can't speak to in terms of how difficult it is and how to get through insurance. Fiasp is getting easier because it's been out for a couple of years now. And then um, Afreza as well. You have to work for you with your providers. And I hope that you guys have, you know, seen some things or learned some things here that you can go to your provider specifically with, hey, I heard about Afreza or I heard about Fiasp or Lumjev. I want to try it. You know, advocate for yourself. And these things are all approved for type ones and you guys should have access to it. So um, hopefully your provider is willing to try to get it. And yeah, it might take some work to go through prior authorization or to look into a, um, a copay card or something like that. Generally, there's ways around these things. And if you persist, um, in most cases, you can get them, get them covered. It's a different issue for Medicare versus not, but talk to your provider and your provider might have to speak to one of the, the local reps um, to get more information on that. Um, so again, you know, someone's commenting, I missed the, the discussion of fat and protein. All this is available online. Um, so you can watch a zillion times, whatever, you know, kind of pick out your, your favorite cases. Um, and there's a question here about control IQ versus looping. Um, so, you know, as we talked about a little bit, looping is a, is a do-it-yourself artificial pancreas system. I was on that for a couple years before going on control IQ. And, and they, they're very similar things. Um, so I would say that um, loop probably has a little bit of a more aggressive algorithm and, you know, it, it targets kind of tighter control, um, but it's not quite as user friendly as the control IQ system. And loop is, is awesome, but you have to set it up yourself. There's no um, custom support or something goes right wrong. It's not FDA approved. So it's a fantastic system. It just takes a little bit more legwork and, you know, so Steve and I, like he's on loop now, I'm on control IQ and you know, it's half a dozen of one, six of the other. So it's just kind of what you prefer. Um, so I think that's, that's pretty much it. So, you know, I do see some other, you know, comments and things that are, that are coming through. It's kind of hard to, to read these in real time. So I, I tried to answer as many as I could, um, you know, as the thing went on. I just want to say, you know, a live sincere thanks to everybody for joining. It's been a tough time for all of us and for TCOID. We're used to going to these places in person. Right now we're supposed to be physically in Omaha. Um, but I think the silver lining is that we can reach a lot of people. We have people signed up from every single state and from 30, 40 countries around the world. Um, so a lot of type ones here to kind of share their knowledge. I love to see the comments. Um, we love to kind of hear from you on our website. Um, we have, you know, since this is a type one audience, the next big thing is October 3rd, where we're gonna have our one conference, which is a whole conference dedicated for people with type one diabetes. Again, that was an in-person event, it was a whole weekend, but now it's, it's a ton of topics that we're gonna have live and then a whole bunch of stuff on demand. Um, pretty much anything you could think about in terms of type one diabetes that you wanna hear about. So definitely stay tuned for that, go to the, the website and look for the one conference. Um, but with that, I'm gonna shut down I think this talk and what we have next, I believe is a break. And then we go into our afternoon workshops and I'm doing a, another type one thing on the, the top 10, like hottest tricks to stay cool with type one diabetes. So hope to, to see you there. So thanks so much.